again, the shot placement matters most. There's no salt on it. I think it's done too. It's, it's <laughs> That's go so comforting. Wow. Okay, now go touch it. Yeah, it feels like styrofoam. I'm serious. Mm -hmm. Let's go for a squeal. I'm gonna go real tight. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> picnic or picnic ham. These have lots of different names and colloquial uh, references depending on where you're at in the country. Um, but broadly speaking, this is your Boston butt, and this is your picnic. Um, Here is your loin and your belly primal. Your loin is going to be separated from your belly, and your belly is going to become bacon. Back here is your ham. But it's important to understand that this is not bacon. And this is not ham yet. This is pork. And this is pork belly. Okay. Only once this has been cured and or smoked is this ham. Only once this is cured and smoked is this bacon. Otherwise, pork chops are an exception. Pork chops are a fresh cut that you can just simply roast or fry or grill, and it's a recognizable pork chop. The Boston butt. Uh, is where you would get your barbecue from because it's not just tough. Uh, it's tough and fatty with a lot of connective tissue. Connective tissue in the way of collagen is what breaks down and makes this a nice, unctuous, lip-smacking piece of meat. If you were to treat this exact same, uh, this, back, this back leg, the exact same as this front leg, it will not yield the same results. So that's why it, its destiny is usually for barbecue. Now, in our world, this is actually better served Still, even though I dig me a barbecue pork sandwich, it is better served still as a capital, uh, which we brought uh, at least one or two of uh, that we'll share tomorrow. But the capicola is this cut, boneless, in tube, also then stuffed into a casing of some kind, cured, and then aged for four to six months, and then thinly sliced. That's your capicola. What remains on the bottom of this Often, often referred to as the picnic, the picnic ham. It's not actually a ham. There's one little piece in there that like, could be recognized, uh, but it's very small, and it doesn't make sense to use it as anything but sausage. This is like the best place on the animal for sausage to come from. So I say that because we want this as either a loin roast or cut into cross sections as pork chops. We already know that this is where our barbecue is going to be from. We already know that this is where our bacon is going to be from. And back here we have the ham, and we have several different directions we could go with it. We would encourage people, almost always, to cure it, because as I say, on its own the ham needs a lot of work to be yummy. If it's cured and turned into prosciutto, for example, or jamon, or very different names depending on where you're at in the world, it can actually <laughs> rise above most of the other animals with just salt and thyme. Everything's mirrored. Yeah, okay. Correct. Two loins, two tenderloins. Which is handy because... If you wanted all pork chops from one loin, you could do that. And then you could take your other loin and decide to do a couple two to four pound roasts. That's actually your nice belly. That's a chart. That's really cool. That's a good And once we get the other one cut out, yeah, we'll go through the chicken. And again, when you're running this thing, you don't want big chunks. Even though the hole is really big. It looks like potato sauce chunks. Yeah, you don't want it. You don't want to make this thing like that. Yeah, you don't need to bog it down. You feed it like I'm feeding it, it'll do all the work. You shouldn't have to like push the chunk stuff in. Like even that chunk is probably a little bit too big. So you would still go ahead and chop it up? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. You, yeah. You don't want to shove big things. Yeah. And some people will tell you to cut out strips. Okay. Do that. Okay. Because sometimes if there's sinew in the strip, it'll get wrapped around the off. Yeah. yeah.
long the skirt steak. That's here. That, that's where the peritoneum kind of goes up onto the diaphragm. Yeah, so and the diaphragm came right off of here. I don't know if you guys remember when I when it was hanging and the lungs sat in here and there's a diaphragm, that really thick white yeah, membrane on the top. It out. So that was attached that. to this. Can I practice that, please? I know you just did it, but... So you, I do it's just a I really shallow really, cut. Yeah, I can't really see things and learn them. I have to do them. Okay, so fine, you're saying... Um, it's just a shallow cut through that membrane. What's the, so there's a membrane on top of the fat? That's what this is. Yeah. Oh, I was wondering what you were pulling off there. Yeah. Okay, that all makes sense to me now. And so the fat will peel away from the rest of the meat that's underneath it. Okay, so so it's just a really, this. I'm not trying to cut into the belly or anything like that. It's you just have to, to be careful not to do puncture marks. Yeah. Oh. And this is just fat. Here, I'll take that. Hold on, I'm practicing here. <laughs> oh, nope. so nope. No, that was when, you're cutting, just my hand when off. you're cutting and you want to hand it to someone, this is your pivot. <laughs> I will say though, I don't get stainless tables to do your butchering, please, 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 because if you have, if you want to do this on even a semi-regular basis, if you and just have some idea, like butcher block top and, and build a simple base for it, but if you have stainless, which the industry will tell you you should have, you're not going to ever want to cut on the stainless. It's going to ruin your knives, and then instead you're going to have to have a cutting board in between the animal and the stainless, which is just sliding around the whole time. It's, a, it's like a nightmare. So if you do it, either just buy some some butcher block or make some whatever, but please don't, please don't. This bend happens in the spine, and we go one vertebrae past it. So this is the tail, okay? And if you can imagine, if we put the other half here, this is the pelvis and the tail, and this is the pelvic canal, or the birth canal, also happens to be where the bung of the animal sent its business out the back end. So there's a nice tender muscle here, the massaging muscle. It's actually referred to as the mouse meat, the oyster, or most commonly the butcher's cut, because it's not one that you're going to find in a butcher shop. Um, for whatever reason, uh, butchers love to steal that for themselves. But again, I'm going to find my vertebrae here. I'm going to go one disc north of that, and that's where I'm going to make my cut. <laughs> yeah. Again, this is very cold, but when you take the tenderloin out, which I'm doing now, post facto, the tenderloin is a very tender muscle, and if you're not careful, you'll shred it to pieces with your fingers. So the, the muscles just kind of lay on one another like this, and they're very tender. So generally speaking, we go from the back to the head. Generally, you can do this just barehanded. Um, and there's some stringy things that attach this uh, muscle to the spine. The stringy things are nerves. And you can often break them with your fingertips. Spe specifically depending on the edge of the animal. The skirt steak, again, more recognizable on a beef. You're not going to get skirt steak from your butcher shop or pork because it's just not that big. It's not really even worth uh, preparing because it's so little. But that's what this is. It does look a little bit like bacon. It's pretty lean. Um, generally speaking, uh, especially on a, on a larger pig or a beef, uh, it's a really good muscle. It's very open grained muscle, and so it takes the marinade very well, which is why it's typically used for like a fajita meat, because fajitas are always going to be marinated, and it takes the marinating very well. Oh, okay. Well, there's most of the tenderloin. Okay. I couldn't tell where the bone stopped, it just kept going. But as it turns out, we have a nice cut here, and it's also the first time you can begin to look at your carcass and, and analyze what it yielded you. Because not, not until you have a cross section can you really see the, the loin, specifically the marbling in the loin, and this has really nice marbling. We often will just find the end of the sternum. Mm. Okay, in the sternum right here, it usually has a cartilaginous end on it, which extends a little bit farther. Uh, depending on when it was sawn in half, whether or not this end is on that half or this half. But we usually go to the end of the sternum and we follow the ribs all the way through. 
Now, I happen to know that there's going to be feather bones here also. So the other half is going to be way easier to primal than this half. Still not a big deal. Mm -hmm. But when I make this cut, I can go all the way down to the table until I get to here. But then this is going to need to be sawn through because not just the spine, but because of the feather bones that are up here. You just take their bacon yeah. and leave. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be like bacon, bacon, bacon Vikings. We've come for your bacon. Bacon burglar. Uh, I know I'm not going to accidentally cut into my loins with my saw. I can go as far north or as south as I want, but because this isn't a ton of belly this way, mm -hmm. I don't want that cut to be yeah. too far south. It starts to burn. Yeah. So you could leave it down to here. You could leave uh, it down again, to here. Again, totally arbitrary. Okay, if so you, you wanted, connect. if you wanted, you could have it. You could have your chops down to here and have like almost the tomahawk style. Yeah. Right? But on this end, it's as it tapers towards the sirloin, it gets way big. Mm. So my my notch is actually going to be in this fatty deposit down yeah. here. I was going to ask you about the tomahawk. That's becoming yeah. more popular. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is that that's ribs? It is your chop with some of the baby back or all the baby yeah. back still attached. Yep. Honey and cream. Yep. So when I, I eyeball down here, see where my loin is, and I made a notch right below it. I did the same thing here. And then I'm going to connect the dots, this dot and this one. And I'm doing that. I'm not going to cut through this rib with my knife, so I'm not trying to. I'm just going to score across the top to here. Okay. And now I know about where I want my cut to go. Okay. And when I make that cut, it's not intuitive, but I do not want to cut on contour or square to my rib. If I do, I'm going to be cutting right through the loin. Instead, I want to make sure I cut straight down to the table so that I'm not going to be filleting my loin during my cut. But on this end, hopefully I was south of them. Yeah, I think I am. On this end, my ribs stop about here. So right here, I can actually cut to the table with my knife. This, I'm going to need to saw through the ribs first with a bone saw. Okay. So I'm going to find my cut, go to the table, versus like cured cuts we kind of go back and forth this is sort of our hybrid version of those but in America usually the Boston butt is separated right down here at the bottom of the spine so I'm going to use my saw and I'm going to cut through the ribs right down here and then I'll have another another little set of spare ribs and the other set of spare ribs is going to be over here we'll take those away we'll take the spine away but it, we could just make this cut and this could be a a shoulder that you'd use for pulled pork, put on a smoker. You could smoke this whole thing as one piece. That's not what we're going to do with it, but that's another option. So I'm going to cut here, and I keep it off the edge of the table because I have to drop my nut, my saw, because I'm only cutting through these bones. I don't want to cut all the way this way. And I, again, I'm just being parallel to this bottom vertebrae. I think Depending on the purpose. pig, usually, sometimes you can hit the joint between the humerus and the shoulder blade. Um, but I didn't, so I'm just going to go through here. And then there's a bone in there that I'm going to finish. <laughs> Stuff, this usually is where most of our sausage comes from. It's from here and then the sirloin above the ham. But the picnic roast is out of that right there. Yeah, you can kind of see where the picnic roast comes from. You see this round sort of muscle group yeah. from the leg? Mm. That's usually where your picnic ham is. There's a large amount of bone inside there also. When Future one is this. making pork rinds, <laughs> you must acquire pork skin. Um, and then you will boil it for two hours. After you get as much fat off as possible. Yes, you want to have it free of fat. After that two hours, if there's any more fat left on it, scrape it off with like a spoon because it'll be soft. Okay. Scrape off all the extra fat. Mm -hmm. and put it in the dehydrator. Small sections. Don't put a section like this. Don't. <laughs> yeah. Well, it would it would explode out of your pan. It would be when it was done. It would be like this big. It would oh, because it puffs up. Yeah. Oh. So yeah. you just want little like little squares. Little chunks. Okay. Crackers. Yeah. Put in your dehydrator. Usually at like 150, okay. 145, 150, for usually eight to 12 hours. 
Ten four. You want them to be like crackers, like they snap when you bend right. them, or you can't bend them actually. You put pressure on the sides, they pop. And then that is your pork rind. Unflavored. Un Un unfried. I was say it's not so you have yet. to put it in a uh, 380 degree oil. Lard okay. is usually what we use. Okay. Drop it in there, it'll drool. You take it out, you salt it, or whatever blend you want to put on it, and then you have French pork rinds. We're going to make pork rinds. Okay. But we decided a long time ago that limiting our pork rinds to salt is a silly uh, and almost ignorant thing. Absolutely. <laughs> like the sky should be the limit when it comes to pork rinds. So oh, we yeah. started like with Creole or what was one of the other early ones we did? Oh, we did some sweet ones that had like Well, that um, was later. Maple syrup. Later on we realized, well, if you dip it in maple syrup, yeah, Cajun it's just seasoning like caramel stuff like that. <laughs> but then if you take it out <laughs> of the skillet, <laughs> if you take it out of the skillet and you dip it in hot butter, like melted butter and then roll it in cinnamon and sugar, it's like an elephant ear or a funnel cake. It is unbelievable. Wow. You should not limit pork rinds to just salt. 